I'm glad you're back with me today. Today we're going to look at another great minister of healing by the name of Dr. John G. Lake. He was born March of 1870. He's a Canadian. We have a few Canadians that uh, America's been blessed with. Sister McPherson was a Canadian and Dr. Lake was a Canadian that came into our country and uh, blessed uh, uh, America very, very much. But he had 15 brothers and sisters. I've always been amused at the large families that some of these uh, great ministers have came from. You know, like John Wesley came from 19 brothers and sisters. Uh, and Lake wasn't too far behind the Wesley brothers and how many people he had in his family. At the age of 16, he left uh, Canada and moved to the northern part of Michigan. Uh, Lake makes a comment in his life that as a child of uh, some of his memories. Now, you would think of a childhood memory would be something about your birthday parties or your friends or some of the schooling that you went to in maybe elementary school or some type of sports that you played. Uh, but Lake said, to quote him, said, I remember as a child, uh, my memories were very sorrowful. They were filled with doctors and they were filled with hospitals and nurses and hearses and caskets and, and graveyards. Uh, I don't call that a very happy memory, but he said that in his life, as a child, he remembered mainly those kind of sad things that were a part of um, his life. Uh, there was a curse in Lake's family uh, that seemed to be always ravaging the bodies of his, of his aunts and uncles and his brothers and sisters. Eight of his brothers and sisters actually died, and four of the other ones had illnesses. And then later in life, four more got sick. So most of his family that he grew up with, he was always taken care of, or they're always coming and going from the doctor's office. In October of 1891, he decided that he would go into ministry school. So he went to a Methodist training center to be trained for the ministry, and he graduated from the ministry school there. But instead of going into the ministry, he decided he would go start a newspaper. Uh, I don't know what happened to him. I guess the school wasn't that good or that inspiring. I think when you go to a Bible college, you should come out there so full of faith and so ready to go that you can't help but start in ministry. Even if no one gives you a door, you just begin by yourself on a street corner and start. But instead of going to ministry, he decided he would start a newspaper in Harvey, Illinois. So he started a newspaper called The Harvey Citizen that I was told is still going today. February the 5th of 1893, he married his wife, which became one of his great partners in ministry, especially when they would move to South Africa in a few years from now. In 1896, his wife uh, began, I guess, to be cursed by the same devil that his parents and his brothers and sisters were. She was announced uh, by the doctors that she had incurable illnesses that they could not fix, they could not give her medicine for, that he was going to have to live with a wife who was sick and possibly would die early and have a premature death. And then as well as he began to find out that his brother was an invalid for 22 years. Then his sister found out she had five cancers in her left breast. And the next sister was also sick with problems she could not fix. And finally, you know, I'm sure that he had bouts of mental depressions, bouts of why is this thing happening to me? I guess anybody would. But then he heard some good news, that there was a man in the Chicago area by the name of John Alexander Dowie, a man that we talked about, the first man that we spoke of in our series, talked about, uh, he heard about this man that could have healing power, to heal the sick, he could get people cured of all types of diseases. They heard about Abraham Lincoln's uh, niece being healed and Buffalo Bill's niece being healed. So different things had got into the newspapers and everything was kind of spreading. Dow at this time was at a height of popularity. And so he telegrammed a Zion and said to Dr. Dyer, would you pray for my wife? The doctor says she's incurable. There's a problem there. Uh, it's not going to go away. And we heard that you could do something about it. Dowie telegraphed back to Lake, I'm going to pray. She's going to be healed. And that's exactly what happened. When Dowie prayed, her illnesses left her. She got up and she was whole. Then he thought, well, if this man can get my wife healed, well, I'm going to bring my brother and my two sisters. So they brought his brother and his two sisters from where they were living all the way to Chicago, Zion, Illinois area and asked Dr. Dowie to pray for them. So Dowie laid hands on his brother, who was an invalid, got up and walked a mile after being prayed for, and he had not been able to walk. Probably even probably 15 steps was a major event that day, but he was healed and walked a mile that day. And so the other two sisters were healed too. And so he went back home with a, a whole family. His wife was whole. 
His sisters were whole. His brother was walking. Now he could go out and work and take care of his, of his own family. And because of the news and people talking about it and seeing these people whole walking around town, the other relatives, the other friends begin to, to share that with their friends. And pretty soon there came knocks at the door of Dr. Lake. And the people were saying, well, your wife got whole. Your brother got whole. Your sisters got whole. Uh, wh why don't you uh, pray for my wife and maybe she'll get whole? Why don't you pray for my neighbor and maybe he'll get whole? And pretty soon he had people coming quite often to his front door saying, pray for my wife, pray for my child, pray, 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 pray for them. They need to be whole too. So Lake was kind of forced into the healing ministry. Uh, some people desire it. Some people just end up with it, and those are the ones that seem to do better with it. Uh, the, the ones that seem to always want it real bad, they have, probably have a, sometimes another motive behind it of trying to have their identity as their ministry or trying to be popular with how many people know that they have a healing ministry. But Lake was forced into the healing ministry, realizing he didn't have all the knowledge that he needed to be successful about it. I guess the Methodist training school didn't do him too good in the ministry of healing, so he decided a great step he would take. So he packed up all of his belongings, sold his home there, and moved to Zion, Illinois, to be a part of Dr. Dowie's beautiful city and to be a part of Dowie's healing ministry and learn about the ministry of healing. So in 1901, it's when John G. Lake moved from where he was in Michigan down to the city of Zion and became an elder in Dr. Dowie's church. And this is about the time that John Alexander Dowie began to uh, go off into some of his eras of identity where he thought he was Elijah the Restorer, one of the first apostles. He began to go off into some things that were not right. But Lake within him had the ability, I believe, to separate what was true and what was not, to take the good and to leave the bad. Uh, sometimes baby Christians don't always have the ability to sort it, but he also had the experience and a little bit of knowledge himself, and he could sort that so he was able to take the good things and leave all the bad. A lot of people in the ministry of healing during this time period were brought into it or affected by it through the ministry of Dr. Dowie, and Lake happened to be one of the great ones that came out of there. When, uh, when Dowie finally began to go into the extreme errors and himself began to have financial troubles with the city, uh, Lake moved from Chicago, moved from Zion back into the city of Chicago and became uh, a businessman and had a seat on the Chicago Board of Trade. And at this time, he records, I had over $100,000 already in the bank over a few deals that he had made. So he had the ability to uh, make money quite quickly, make money quite fast. He was a very fluent businessman. You know, in his life so far, he's, he's been a newspaper founder. Founder. He's been a real estate agent, uh, a healing minister, and now he goes back in the world of business. And with just a little bit of time, he has $100,000. Now, remember, this is in 1904, so when you say $100,000, that's probably like a million or something today with people having that much money in that particular uh, time period of our, of our history. Uh, Dr. Lake, why was in Chicago, was offered a $50,000 a year salary. And again, let's just remember what that meant in 1904 uh, when it was offered to him. So he began to work for this particular company making uh, very good money because people could see within him the ability to achieve quickly. People believed him and uh, he could close deals quite quickly. And he said, uh, let me just quote this for you on this. When I came, when a man came into my office, though I knew I could make twenty or $30,000 in just a few moments by closing a deal, I also had the ability to discern his motive and his inner capacity or his inner life. And within a few moments, I would turn my conversation uh, from talking about business and trying to close the deal into uh, how his heart was toward God, what his inner life was toward God, and he wanted to get saved or was he a backslidden person. And I began to talk to him about how to come back and live for God. He said, this kept happening to me over and over. Here's what you got. You got a man that's called to preach, a man that's called into the ministry of healing, a man that's more concerned about the inner life than all the outward uh, needs of a person. And so he's trying to do business, but at the same time, he ended up always doing the ministry. But the company did not want to let him go. So the boss man came to him and said, uh, Dr. Lake, why don't you take three months off and go get this preaching thing out of your system and uh, come back and I'll give you your salary and your job will be here waiting for you because we don't want to lose you. So take three months off. So Dr. Lake said, well, we'll take it. And so he went for three months out preaching and preached in different cities, had great great salvations and great healings he recorded and very large crowds in some parts of the country where he preached. And he decided that uh, he had not go back and take the job. He decided that from that day forward, he would no longer work in the secular world. He would always, from that day forward, preach the gospel and proclaim salvation and healing to everybody that he met. So he went back to the boss man and said, 
I don't want $50,000 a year. Uh, I don't want my nice office. Uh, I don't want all the nice things you want to give me. Don't even try to, to uh, pull me back in with new things you want to give me and entice me with. I've decided I'm going to live the rest of my life preaching the gospel of salvation and healing to every person. Well, then something very wonderful happened to Dr. Lake. In just a little season, God gave him, he said, a four-hour vision. I'd be happy for four minutes, but he had a four-hour vision. He said that for four hours, the Spirit of God kept coming to him and showing him things, and God would speak to him and come to him and show him things. And in this vision, he saw uh, things pertaining to the city of Zion where he just left. He saw that he was supposed to go to Indianapolis, Indiana, and hold a, a great crusade there. And something great about South Africa, that in this vision, God told him, you are to go to South Africa and live a part of your life and to be a missionary and to work for me in that part of the world. Well, Lake said, fine. And so Lake knew what he had to do about the city of Zion. He went to Indianapolis and rented a nice big large auditorium, paid for it, hold a big crusade there and did what God wanted him to do. And then uh, he realized, one of his friends said to him one day, uh, well, it's time to go to South Africa, but we're going to need a, a certain amount of money. And they asked him, well, how much money are you going to need? So they looked at taking his wife, and this particular time, he had seven children. Uh, Lake had 12 children throughout his, uh, throughout his life. Uh, that's another one of those big families. I guess he came from a big family, and he only knew how to have a big family. So can you imagine, back in these early days of the 1900s, he's going to take his wife, and his seven little children, and one of his friend, and uh, his wife, and their children, and they're going to get on a boat, and go all the way to South Africa, and become a missionary there, didn't know anybody there, didn't know what to do when they got there, had no money, except from the vision, God said, it's time to go to South Africa. So, uh, his friend said, well, we better pray about it. And Lake told his friend, well, I've been praying about it for quite some time. Well, the friend said, I think we should pray about it right now. So Lake said they got down and they prayed, and the man got up in a few moments after prayer and says, God told me we've got the money. He said, all right, well, then let's just wait for it to come. In a few days, they received a, a mail, uh, a letter in the mail, and had 500, four or 500 draft notes, dollars there for them, and they were able to have all the money they need to get to South Africa. But this is some interesting things that I thought was uh, uh, kind of interesting. On his way to the boat out on the New York Harbor, he had to take one of his friends on the train and, and drop them off on one of the stops of the train, and they had no money. So he told his wife, he said, we got to buy this lady here that's with us. Another train ticket is going to cost about $10, and I, we don't have no money to do it. So he said they just bowed their heads there on the train, him and his wife, and they prayed and said, God, um, we need 10 more dollars to take care of this lady that we promised to buy her the train ticket home when she was done helping us. And so they just lifted their heads when they were done praying and went ahead and joined the train ride. They got to the station, didn't have no money. When they got to the station, they got off, and one of his friends came up and met him and said, you know, Dr. A, can I talk to you for a moment? So they walked down the, the railroad station a little ways away from the party they were with, and he said, I just felt led to give you this. I hope you're not offended by this. And it was a $10 bill. So Lake said, no, I'll take it. It's an answer to one of our prayers. He takes the $10 and goes over and buys a ticket for this lady that had been helping them and buys her a ticket to go all the way back to her home while they're on their way to South Africa. So now he, he, he gets to the boat. And he has no money either. But all he has, God's paid for his way to get to the boat and paid for his way uh, to South Africa on that boat. But he just has no money himself. He's got a wife and he's got, you know, seven children. And they're leaving New York on their way to London. Then from London down to Cape Town, South Africa. He only has about $1.25 left to his name. And that's all he has in his pocket, and he's on his way around the world, has no money to get into the country. Because when you get to South Africa, most countries want to make sure you have enough money to take care of yourself while you're there and don't become a liability to the country. So he's on the boat and has about a dollar twenty-five or so left to his name. And uh, so he's there, rides across the Atlantic Ocean to London and gets there and uh, leaves 50 cents for one of the men that helps him there in his room, another 50 cents for the steward that helps him around the boat, different things. All he's got left is about, oh, 25 cents or so to his name, maybe just a few more pennies, but not more than 25 cents. And he, he gets into England, and the boat company puts him up for a night or so in a hotel while they're waiting for the other boat to come in and, and get boarded and then go on to Cape Town, South Africa. And so hey, they have to do the laundry. So he says to his wife, um, we don't have no money but a quarter. Uh, why don't you just go ahead and uh, send it down there? God will take care of it. So they kind of forgot about it for a while, about a day or so. And then by the time they were going to bed, his wife said, well, you know, we have to get the laundry in the morning. Uh, do you have the money? 
And can you imagine telling your wife you don't have enough money to pick up her, her clean clothes, the baby's clean clothes, your clean clothes? Uh, they had no money. So we got up and went out to pray a little bit about it. And while he was out praying, walking up and down the street, a man walked up to him and gave him the money that he needed to take care of all of the, the laundry, which is back then about a dollar sixty-five. he said, is what he needed to take care of all the laundry. Gave him about two or three dollars, had that to take care of all of his little expenses there and take care of the laundry. But he left for South Africa again with no money. And he had no place to stay when he got there. He's got a wife. He's got seven little children. He's got his associate, Tom, Tom's wife, and their children, and they have no money. So when you get to the border of South Africa, you've got to show uh, the immigration officer your documents, and they'd also ask, uh, can I see the money that you have? They've done that to me as I went into different countries to preach. They want to know how long I want to stay, how you're going to take care of yourself. Can we see your cash or your cashier's checks or whatever you've got? Can you prove that you can take care of yourself before we let you in? So you have to pull out your credit card. You have to pull out your cash and say, I can take care of myself. It's not going to be no liability to you or to your people. And then they'll stamp your passport and you go on in. Well, uh, he said to his wife, as they were discussing the issue, he had to have 125 U.S. dollars just to get into the country. Can you imagine a man with a wife and seven children come up to an immigration officer, a customs officer, and uh, here's our documents, here's our passports, and they say, uh, we, we want to see how much money you got. You've got an awful big family here, and he had no money. So his wife said, what are you going to do? We have no money to go back. We have no money to get in. What are you going to do? He says, I want to get in line, and we're going to go in. So he gets in the line waiting for the immigration, the customs officer, uh, his turn with them, and a man behind him comes and taps him on the shoulder. And Dr. Lake turns around and says, yes, can I help you? He says, could I talk to you privately for a moment over here on the side? So they, they leave the line they're in, and can you imagine how long those immigration lines are uh, coming off those big ocean liners? We get upset when a plane uh, drops off 300 people in America because we can't get through it about 10 or 15 minutes, and you're all upset, but I'm sure it took a long time to process all these people. So they stepped out of the line. And Lake did not know this man. And this man said, I just feel like I'm supposed to give you some money. And he said, here's 200 U.S. dollars that I wanted to give you. And God supplied the need right there in the line on his way to meet the custom and immigration officers. Well, that wasn't the last thing that was happening. The last thing that was going to happen was where are they going to stay once they get into the country? They have a little bit of money now, but you can't use, you can use $125, $200 real quickly when you're overseas with a wife and seven children and a man and his wife and all of his kids. So your money is going to disappear quite fast. So they come through the, the immigration lines and now they're in South Africa and they, they're standing there and all of a sudden they see a, a woman there that he says, I could tell by the way she was dressed that she was an American woman. And he said, my friend Tom was in front of me with his family and she walked up to him and said, uh, uh, are you a American? He goes, yes. Uh, how many is in your family? How many is with you? He goes, well, so many, about four. He goes, it's me, my wife, and two children. He goes, that's what's in our family. He goes, well, you're not the one, the lady said, and walked on past him kind of abruptly and uh, walked up to Dr. Lake and said, uh, how many is with your group? He goes, uh, there's me and my wife and seven children. So there's about nine of us. She said, you're the one. He, she, she said, last night the Lord told me that I was supposed to come here and meet a missionary family from America of nine and give them my home to stay in uh, while you're here. So by three o'clock that afternoon, Dr. Lake his beautiful wife, all of his seven children had moved into an already furnished, beautiful home that was given to them to stay in while they were there in South Africa. Uh, I would say that should encourage you that God's with you. Uh, coming from a vision that he had while I was in Chicago, and that God said, you're going to go to South Africa for me, and you're going to preach for me there, and you're going to establish churches for me there, you're going to do some wonderful things uh, for me there, and all he had was a word. That's the way most things begin in ministry. According to logic and according to the way people think about things, uh, many times they... Um, they think we've got to have so much money up front and have all the right doors open. And I guess that would be real nice if that's the way it always worked. But sometimes it doesn't work that way. Uh, as I've studied the lives of biblical personalities and the lives of church history personalities, I've found the greatest events and the greatest steps of faith begin with nothing but a word and an inner confidence that God is going to provide for them. Lake just trusted when the $2,000 came in the mail. He said, this is the beginning. He got the $10 for his friend to send her home on a different train as 
they were heading on out for the boat on the eastern seaboard. They got there, and they had only a dollar twenty-five to their name. They had to leave a dollar for those around for a little tip for those that helped them on crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Got to Great Britain, had twenty-five cents, had to pay for the laundry of a dollar sixty-five. And a man on the street just walked up, didn't know him, handed him several dollars and, and was able to take care of all of their expenses there. Headed for South Africa, got in a line and had no money, and they're going to be asking, can you show me the money you have to take care of yourself and your family while you're here? Had not even a cent to his name, and a man tapped him on the shoulder and pulls him out of the line and says, I don't know why, but I just feel like I want to give you $200 here. And I'm sure Lake said, well, I receive it, and I accept it, and he put it in his hand, and Lake uh, took a hold of it, got back in line, and took his family. Now, when you walk across that line, $200, like I said, that's not a lot of money. Maybe a little bit more back in those days, but still not a lot of money to take care of nine people yourself and four more besides, and you're there to preach and live for a while, and here comes a, an American woman that says God spoke to her the night before and said there's a missionary family of nine coming. Go meet them and give them your house. So about three o'clock that afternoon, after they landed there, they were in their own home, unpacked, had all the kids in their own bedroom, and they began to do their great ministry in South Africa. Lake's ministry in South Africa is one of great phenomena. Of course, his ministry uh, is, is, is phenomenal if you just read the stories of all the testimonies and, and what uh, has happened in his life. And I wrote some of my favorite ones down that I'd like to, to, to talk about with you. Some of the stories that I heard from his daughter. I had the ability uh, for a few years before she passed away to know Dr. Lake's son-in-law and his daughter. I remember when they came to Tulsa where I lived there at that time and I heard they were in town so I called them and said, can I come over and interview you? And they said, we'd love to. And so I went over to interview them. They pulled out of all of Dr. Lake's pictures, some of what you're seeing at different times throughout this particular lecture. And uh, they said, well, this is, you know, when he was this old and was this, when this was happening and all these stories. And they began to tell me different stories as they knew it themselves. One of my favorite stories, when he first got there, he found that there was a plague in South Africa and people were dying, but the people were so scared of the people that had died that they didn't want to touch them and didn't want to bear them, scared that they would get the disease themselves. And that was one way that they could contract the disease that was happening there in South Africa. But Lake went out and grabbed the shovel and began to help bury the dead so that at least other folks wouldn't get uh, sick and die themselves. And the doctors came and said, man, do you know what you're doing? Do you know that you're writing your own death certificate out by touching these bodies? Because we don't know how this disease is contracted, but if you mess with the dead and you mess with them the wrong way without protection and different things, well, my friend, you're going to die. He says, no, when the disease touches me, it dies. And they went, yeah, right. There's something wrong with this. But he goes, no, the law of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. So that law that I have in Christ Jesus gives me power over this disease that causes death. He says, you can take the germ and put it in my hand and you can watch it die. And the doctors and the few scientists and now that have got uh, uh, listening to Lake, the Lake has got their attention, turn and say, all right, we'll do that experiment. And so they went and got some of the saliva from some of the people that had died and put on his hand, put his hand under some special microscopes and begin to see that the disease began to die in his hands, and he never got sick. He was one of the ones that helped bury the dead and take care of the sick. And the doctor says, well, you've got something we don't have. And Lake goes, well, you can get it if you want it. It all comes through Christ. You see, spiritual laws cause the natural to bend. When you believe them and have them as a revelation, not just a mental mindset, but a revelation inside of you, then you can do those kind of things. He said, the law of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death had no power over him, and that was one way that it was proven. Some of the other great stories that I love to hear about him in South Africa was another one when he was out holding up a, a ministry campaign out among the native Africans that he had to leave. And, you know, when you have a healing ministry in Africa, I mean the Africans show up from everywhere because they don't have all the medical uh, 
doctors and hospitals like we do here in Western world, or especially in America with all of our good scientific breakthroughs and the miracle drugs that we have, still today they don't have the same access to it as we do. So when a healing preacher comes to town, well, you're a great hope and you don't cost nothing. So they run out to you and whatever you tell them, they'll believe and they get healed. Wigglesworth said this about the ministry of healing. He said, I can see there's going to come a day when it's going to be hard to get people healed because there's already so many remedies that people can go to besides the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that is also true today in America. You can get people healed, but in some of the countries where there's not all the other possibilities, God is their final hope, and they get healed so quickly and so fast. And it's so beautiful to see that. I wish Americans could say, well, we have the hospital, but we're going to go to God first. But he was in this campaign where he was preaching, and he had to leave. The, and the sick had lined up, and he'd been praying for him, but he couldn't stay there any longer. He had to leave. Nighttime was coming. He had to get home to his wife and his seven children. And he said, now, everybody here, you see this rock that I'm standing next to? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, lay my hands on this particular rock. I'm going to ask God to anoint this place. And any of you that are sick, just come up here and touch this rock. And I believe that when you touch it, the only that I leave in it, the power that I leave in it, will go into you and make you whole. Can you just imagine how many of those native Africans run up to that rock and tried to touch it? And it is written in the history books of some of the ones that wrote their life stories that when people touched that rock, that uh, stoved up arms were loosed, little fingers that were kind of being torn away by leprosy began to grow back over a period of time, came back into a whole finger. All different types of miracles happened over that. I remember one time I had a person say, well, I just can't believe that story. I just can't believe that somebody could lay hands on a rock and, and do that because the Bible only talks about a prayer cloth. I think it's just the law of uh, contact and transmission. They just put their faith. He released what he had, and that's the way it worked, and they got healed. It doesn't matter. I know anything. I heard one person pray over a piece of bubble gum and send it to their sister that was mentally ill because they couldn't send prayer cloths into the mental hospital. And when they begin to chew the gum, all of a sudden that person's mind snapped back right in a few months. They were out and had their own job and doing their normal life because of the anointing. Folks, God can do what he wants to do. Don't put God in a box. Let God be God. Another one of the, the great stories that, uh, he, that I heard about and one of his friends told me about was one time he told the story that he and his friend were praying at a certain place and a certain community had got some type of disease in South Africa and they were dying and the majority of the population of this small community uh, had been uh, sick and the rest of them were dying. The few were okay, but most of them were sick. And so Lake said, well, we better pray for them. So they knelt down on a hill that kind of overlooked this territory, and they began to pray for God to, to do a miracle. And Lake said, myself and my friend looked up at the same time over the city, and God pulled back uh, the natural ability to see, and all of a sudden the ability to see to the Spirit came to them. And they said they saw demon spirits beginning to look up at them while they were praying. And when they stood up and began to walk toward the city, that all of a sudden they said like hundreds of, of evil spirits began to leave this community and leave the homes. And the next day, the doctors didn't understand it. People didn't understand it. But everybody woke up feeling great feeling whole, and only about a two days did it take for everybody to be whole, but almost the morning after this vision happened, everybody felt normal. Some were up the next day working around their house because they had prayed. Now, people say, well, I don't know about that. That's what you get when you have unbelief. But you get what Lake had because you have faith. And I do believe a lot of things can happen more if people would believe and pray. There was another time that Lake told a story about a man that... Uh, about a woman that he had prayed for, but the way he got to pray for him was of interest. Uh, Dr. Lake was in South Africa in a big prayer meeting after he got done preaching, and he knelt down on the platform to pray, he said, and he's, all of a sudden he saw shafts of light coming into his being, and it pulled him up into the spirit realm, he said, and he began to travel and begin to move across uh, uh, the vast lands of Africa and went over the seas and went back into the nation of Great Britain, into the little uh, countryside of Wales, into an institution and went into this building, into a room where people were mentally ill. And he prayed for this woman who was mentally ill and her mind snapped back in this translation and immediately said, I came back the same way that I left. And, and, and I would say, well, what happened? He wrote it in his journal. And years, or not years, probably months later when he was back in England, he was in this territory and said, did anything strange happen here? They said, well, not that anything is strange. Well, we had a great report. So-and-so's mind was lost. And one day she just woke up and her mind was whole. 
when they compared the doctor's report and Dr. Lake's journal of the date and the time, it was coincided at the same time. That the time that he said, I left in my, in, out of my body and had this experience and being translated from South Africa to Wales and prayed for this woman, her mind snapped back, the doctor said. Those are some of the phenomenal meetings and miracles that he had there. Uh, we must also, as I told you in this series, I, I have to tell you the truth about everything. Uh, Dr. Lake had a great tragedy in South Africa. And I don't say this to be negative or, or to criticize him, but hopefully we can learn a great lesson. And with all due respect, I will tell you uh, this, this sad event. His wife, Jeannie, uh, died in South Africa. And she died of malnutrition and exhaustion in South Africa. She would be home taking care, of course, of seven children. Uh, I think they knew seven children could wear you out anyway. But what you have is all the folks begin to realize that this home had a healing family in it. And so the sick would come and lay on the lawn of Dr. Lake's home there in South Africa. And while he was gone, uh, his wife, Mrs. Lake, would cook meals for the children, for everybody outside, and she wouldn't eat herself. She'd take care of the sick. She'd pray for the sick and minister to them. So she would give herself to the point that where she actually uh, lost her life on the work in South Africa. Now, the first set of children, uh, the seven that went with them, had a very, very rough time accepting the death of their mother. Can you imagine waking up one morning in a strange country? And you have people, you wake up in the morning, look out your window, you just don't see the sunrise, but you look out on your lawn and you don't see your friends want you to come down and play soccer or play football or basketball or baseball with you or go play. You see sick people all over the front lawn of your house and you look out and your mother's cooked breakfast for them as well as for you. Yours is on the kitchen table inside, but she's outside feeding the sick, giving it to them that brought the sick and she's getting uh, pale, she's getting thin, and one day you wake up and find out that your mother has passed away in the nighttime. Well, you know, that's awful hard on anybody, especially your husband, but can you imagine a child? The first set of children that uh, Dr. Lake had turned against him for a lifetime. Dr. Lake's first set of children, we showed you a picture, maybe we can put that back up there. The children you see now are the children that to this day uh, have a great uh, inward dislike for their father. You say, why? They blame him for the death of their mother. And even to the day when some of them have passed away, they still had a degree of that, of that anger inside of them. Even though one of the, the great grandsons said that at one time he was at the bedside of one and one said, I sure wish dad was here to pray for me and I wouldn't be having these pains no more. They believed in the healing ministry. But at the same time, they never were able to overcome the emotional trauma of losing their mother on the foreign mission field. When those children got to the age of about 15 or so, they left home, went to Canada, and got some secular jobs and began to live what we would call a sinful life and didn't follow the Lord. And there's even question today that if they died even in faith, uh, uh, hoping and believing. But some of the family has told us that, that they didn't even know if some of his children from the first wife uh, even died in faith. So why would I tell you that? Not to cause disrespect to Dr. Lake, because there's so much to respect. But his greatest sorrow, we just found one of his letters where he wrote, if he had some things that he would change, he would have changed how he ran his South African ministry. Because the greatest sorrow of his life was losing his wife in South Africa. He had to leave his children in South Africa with, with his associate Tom for a while and some others while he had to come to England and to America to raise money eventually to buy enough, uh, have enough money to buy the boat tickets to get his family back to America. But eventually he got the money, brought the children home and moved to Spokane, Washington. He did later remarry a wonderful woman and had some more children. And like I told you earlier, he had 12 children in his whole life. And the children by the second wife were more accommodating and more understanding. I, I guess you can understand that. The first one went through the traumas and the, the next set of children didn't go through the same type of situation. But Lake was known, he moved to the city of Spokane, Washington. He was known as a man that began a healing home, one of those great healing homes. He trained people that he called healing technicians. And one of the things that he did before they could become a healing technician in his healing home there in Spokane, Washington was they had to go find a sick person and stay with them until they got healed and not come home. Can you imagine your assignment that day as you're being trained in the healing ministry that today you're going to go out and you're going to be at this bedside of this sick person and you cannot come back to school and you cannot go home until that person gets healed. You just stay there and read the word to them, minister to them, help them until they are healed. Well, some came back in a few hours, some came back in a couple of days, and, and the daughter told me one time, some came back in about a week and a half, but they all came back with the person healed. And that's why Dr. Lake 
and these healing technicians uh, had over a hundred thousand documented miracles in five years to where the United States government declared that the healthiest city in America was Spokane, Washington and the mayor of the city said it's mainly because of Dr. Lake's healing rooms. There's another kind of funny story. They begin to hear reports of all these dramatic miracles of the little boy taking off the braces and different ailments and they ran the healing home like you would a doctor's hospital. You come in, they find out what's wrong with you, your physical condition, your spiritual condition, and they would give you a spiritual prescription, in other words, so much prayer, confession these scriptures, reading the Bible certain stories, and doing these certain things, and we'll see you in about 10 days, and we'll do a checkup on you. And that's how they ran their healing homes and prayed for them, sometimes went to their homes when they weren't physical, physically able to come themselves, and they ran that home. And so the Better Business Bureau began to investigate all these reports about Dr. Lake. And so Dr. Lake uh, said, well, come on in. We can document them for, for you. And they began to read the first couple and said, we can't handle this. this. We don't understand this. We can't handle this. So they quit their investigation within just a few hours of it beginning because they mentally could not handle all the documents they had of people that were, this was their problem, and now they don't have it. And so they said, these things are true. So Dr. Lake had a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful healing ministry. He traveled quite a lot throughout you know, that part of America. He was well respected. He corresponded with Charles Parham. In fact, here's a little bit of what I would call historical trivia that you may be interested in. The man Charles Parham, as I told you about him in Topeka, Kansas, was speaking in Dr. Lake's church the night that Gordon Lindsay was converted. Now, Gordon Lindsay is the man that built Christ for the Nations, that is a great Bible school today, as well as he's a man that God used in a few years to help lead and be what they call the 20th century Barnabas of coordinating, keeping all the fellowship and keeping peace between the Pentecostal denominations and the voice of healing evangelists. He was the leader of that particular movement and correspondence and was the, the one that kept them all kind of in peace and kept them morally straight and doing these things. But he was converted in Dr. John G. Lake's church. Can you give me a, give you a few more things about Dr. Lake? When he lived in Spokane, Washington, where we get all of his great sermons, there's many books with his sermons and his teaching him, his second wife was one that would sit on the front row and take down in shorthand all the things that he said and all the things that he taught in the school there, and he would, she would take it down. And that's why we have so many of his wonderful teachings and sermons today. So many millions of people, I believe, in Christian throughout the years have enjoyed reading his teaching and reading what he had to say about healing and deliverance and these wonderful, wonderful ministries. He also was a man that had to learn how to take care of his family a little bit more. Here's a, a little story, and I want to talk about that as a point we can learn from Dr. Lake. There's so many good things, but I want to make this a point first. Uh, his daughter told me one time, to have uh, our father's attention was something very special to us. There was always people at him. He was traveling. And he said, we knew that he loved us, but to have his attention where he focused on us where he talked to us, where he did something with us, was a little bit unusual. He, she said, one night I, I was told by my father that he was going to take me out, just him and me, to a restaurant, and we're going to have the evening to ourselves. She said, I thought I had the best thing coming to me. It was almost like a birthday present, almost like Christmas to her. She said, she said I was so excited about it. I get to be with Dad, just me and Dad all by ourselves, and we're going out to a restaurant. So they go out to a restaurant to eat, and Dr. Lake is there, and they order their food, and they're just having small talk. And all of a sudden, their meal came, and right in the middle of their meal, he jumped up and said, I know how to finish that sermon. He got up and walked out the restaurant, left his daughter sitting there, and dropped in his car, and drove, and she had to call and say, uh, you forgot me. Now, I love Dr. Lake. He, there are so many good things about him, but I think he needs to be a little bit more in touch with this world at certain times than the other world. I think he learned a great lesson in South Africa with his, with his first wife, the loss and the sorrow of it. But I think also he might have still needed to adjust a little bit more about raising his 12 children. And I think that uh, a lot of times ministers allow hardships and the ministry to eat up all of their time to where you know the, um, the ministry eats up the time for the children. The children get the place where they're bitter against the ministry. And that's why sometimes you have such hardships with what you call preacher's children. And I think you have to realize a couple of things. Number one, no matter what people say, they're still your children. And children have to grow up. And sometimes they have one standard for everybody else's child, but a different standard with the children of the pastor, the associate pastor, and the people who try to compare uh, them to this new standard and not letting the child be a child. Every child's got to grow up. Every child has to learn how to do certain things. 
They think, well, this pastor's child, you know, should know more scripture and should maybe conduct themselves better in the Sunday school class. And they have, you know, these different little rules and these different little uh, standards. And I think that's a problem. I don't allow that in my church. I told the church of all of our pastoral team that their children will be held to the same thing we hold their children to and will not expect anything different than them we expect from their children. So there's not this unnatural expectation that makes the child feel, I can never add up. I can never achieve. I can never win. It's always like I'm losing. I can't add up to everybody's expectation. And they grow up with a bitterness and an anger. Another thing that happens with pastors and their children is they don't make time for them. Even sometimes the, the head man won't make time for his wife. And so pretty soon the wife uh, begins to get mad at the ministry because the ministry stole her husband. Well, that's because the husband won't make things priority and make the family first and the ministry second. And pretty soon you have great trouble. And pretty soon you have divorce on your hands. Or with the children, the children go out and they go into the world. They start looking to other people to be their guides and their parents. I've been in pastor's homes where it's like, can anybody see this? Can people see what's going on here? That the child here is, is, is looking to somebody else and almost knows more about that man than you do, and you're the father, and that man's just a, a man in your church or a neighbor next door. Hello, so would somebody wake up? And some people don't wake up until it's almost too late. So hopefully what I'm talking to you today, you'll be charted a little bit, you'll look at something and say, well, you know, we need to change a few things. If you gain the whole world, and they call you great, and they call you wonderful, and you lose your wife, and you lose your children, and you lose the influence, and you lose that ability and that blessing you're supposed to have uh, in your life, and then what have you gained? I think priorities are important. Popularity is not as important as your wife and your children. Having a big name and a big ministry and a big church is not as important as having your wife love you and be with you throughout all the days of your life and having harmony between your heart and her heart. And there's nothing greater than having children who raise, who, who come up to the age of adulthood and begin to stand up and say, my parents were great blessings to me. My parents blessed me. My parents taught me right. I blessed them. I honor them. How many parents have heard their children cuss them out and despise them and, and say negative things about them? Well, you weren't there when I needed you. You, know, you didn't do this when I needed you. You say, well, Roberts, you don't know what I went through. Yeah, but you still had a wife and you still had children and they still needed to be a priority. Those things have to be first. I've said this a lot to our Bible college students. You know, before Adam had a wife, uh, he had a job, and when he got a wife, he didn't take care of her, right? So he lost his job and his house, and the same thing goes for ministers today. If you do not take care of getting your life in order for a family, so when you have a wife and you have children, there is a foundation, there is a platform built for it, and then once you have a family, take care of them, provide for them, love them, direct them, uh, and admonish them, not just with words, but also with the way you live. Because sometimes we want our children to obey our words, but they obey our lifestyle. And how we live behind closed doors is what our children will live publicly one day. And this brings another interesting point. God, you know, watches what you do. He also listens to what you say. But what you are behind closed doors is where God will have the greatest source of evaluating your life. You can be the most wonderful person out front. And you can be the most charismatic personality with the loving words and the kind smile and the, and the beautiful ministry and the graceful words that you preach with. And then as soon as you walk off the platform, you turn into another person. You live like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You got it all messed up. And you think that's the way it is. And one day, you know, the, the wife goes, I don't love you no more. And the children go, I can't wait to get to college and get away from you. I, I don't like you no more. You're, 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 you're two different people. You know, we shouldn't live like that, but it takes a decision. You see, many Pentecostal charismatics want anointings, but you see, decisions attract anointings. We want anointings to make decisions, and that's why we get in trouble. And so many times we're going to have to come back to the understanding our decisions on how we live, what we do, and what we say is going to attract anointings to us. And we have to make a decision of how we're going to live in the home life. You're going to make a decision how you're going to treat your children and keep to that decision. Because I know I've had people come in my office and they talk to me, well, you know, my, my wife wants to leave me. Uh, I say, why? When you start going through the process, you say, well, why haven't you made a choice to tell people you're not going to be in the office on this day and you're going to be with your family and on birthdays and anniversaries and, and holidays and special events, you just mark them off your calendar and say, I don't preach that day. I'm not going to travel that day. I'm going to be with my family. I'm going to enjoy my family. I, and you say, well, I do that. Well, then maybe you should just take off some other days that aren't special days and say, I'm going to make this a special day and be, and be with my family. 
one of the great challenges of the last days is keeping the Christian home together, keeping the minister's home together. It's going to take right decisions. It's going to take prayer. It's going to take resisting the powers of the devil. It's going to take praying. It's going to take living right, spending time together. No matter how dark it is, it shouldn't take away the joy of your family and having a beautiful, beautiful wife and all the things that God wants you to have, but you have to take care of it. You have to have to protect it. You have to develop those things or don't come like that. To me, that's one of the great lessons we can learn from Dr. Lake. Besides, he's persistent in the healing ministry. You know, he just kept praying, learning how to minister more effectively to the healing. And people would come to him from all over the world to get him to pray for them. And I can't kind of find that sad, even though, you know, that caused you to admire the man that people would travel, you know, thousands of miles to get to the healing homes in Spokane, Washington. But, you know, somebody in their city should have the ability to pray for them right there and get them healed. Somebody in that city should have the ability to cast out evil spirits and set them free. It said that people will travel all those thousands and hundreds of miles when somebody right next door could have done it for them if they just stepped out and done it and prayed for them and did what they were supposed to do. People say, well, you know, I have not been taught. Well, what kind of church do you go to then? You know, many times uh, you don't know something because the church you go to don't teach anything or teach to that level of understanding. You, you can't go to a church just because it has nice facilities. Thank God for nice facilities. But first, what's being taught there? What are your children learning in the, in the, church, the children's church and in the Sunday school classes? What are they learning? What are they growing up in? What's being taught to them? So many times we go because it's convenient. Well, sometimes convenience is driving a few extra miles across town to get the church that will teach you the Word of God and show you how to live right and how to be a minister, and your children do the same thing. Uh, a church that's like that is worth the extra time, the extra effort, and the extra money it might take to get you and your family there. There's nothing greater than a spiritual education. If you don't have spiritual knowledge, then you don't know what to receive from God, and God can't use you if you don't know it's available for mankind to have it. And so many people suffer, not just because of the devil attacks them, but because of ignorance. The Bible says without knowledge, people perish. People get into trouble. They die early. They go through tragedies. These things occur because of the lack of spiritual knowledge. And in all you were learning, you may go to the greatest universities in America, the greatest universities in Great Britain, uh, in Asia, wherever you may be going, great universities. And it's good to have that expertise and that natural training. But always remember, spiritual knowledge, my friend, supersedes all natural knowledge. You can become a psychiatrist, but you may not know how to live with your wife. You may not know how to do these certain things. That's why some of them commit suicide. Spiritual knowledge teaches you how to live and be success in any arena of life. And so in all of your getting, and all of your spending, make sure you spend time and you spend money to get yourself in good seminars, in good churches, and good places where you can learn, your wife can learn, your children can learn. Uh, I tell you, if I lived in Spokane, Washington, I don't went to Dr. Lake's church, and I would try to get to be trained by him to become one of his healing technicians and be able to get in there and learn how to pray for the sick, minister to them, and raise them up so they can be living a normal life. Dr. Lake died. And as an elderly man, he lived a full good life, but he died when he had a stroke. He died after having three, in fact, and then the last one he was unconscious for, I think, about a week before he passed away. And people say, well, you know, why does a, a man that believes in healing like he did uh, die such a tragic death like that? Well, there's several reasons, and some I don't know all the reasons, but some maybe sometimes people just give up on certain things. I don't know if that was his particular problem, but it could have been. Uh, I don't have all the answers to that. Sometimes great people of healing have developed faith for everybody else but themselves. That was one of Miss Kuhlman's problems, that she had faith for everybody else and didn't develop faith for herself. She knew how to get you healed and uh, didn't know how to have faith to get her own self healed. So when you're in the ministry of healing, the ministry of deliverance, uh, make sure you develop your own faith so that you can live whole and you can live normal and you can have a, a good life. Because God wants us to leave the earth like you see the old patriarchs in the Old Testament, full of life, full of years, bless your children, give the inheritance that you have to them, and just sit down and take off is, I believe, God's desire and highest, best for all of us. You know, when a man leaves the earth, it's not really a sad thing. It's a graduation time. When a righteous man leaves the earth, he goes on to a better life, freer from the weight of the physical body, freer from the weight of this natural system of the world. And so many times we grieve and we grieve. And I know we miss them, but in the Christian realm, when somebody passes on to be with the Lord, it's not goodbye forever. It's just we'll see you a little bit later. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, precious 
is the death of his saints. That God uh, hovers around him. Angels hover around the people of God when it's time to make their transition from the natural world into the spiritual world. There should never be a fear of death within you. And when you know the power of God to heal when you walk the earth, when it comes time for you to leave this earth, you finish your course and you step across that line, it's not a scary thing. It's not a frightful thing. On the other side is all the beauty that you can have, all the, all the glory that you, can, that you can drink in and enjoy for a lifetime, for eternity. And I believe in that day when Dr. Lake left this earth, he fulfilled his course, and he passed from this natural life into the next life. And I'm sure today he's enjoying seeing his children. He's enjoying seeing his wife. He's enjoying seeing some of the fellow ministers that he preached with while he was on this earth. And I'm sure they're sitting around a table walking down the streets. They've been talking about the greatness of God that they saw while they were on this earth. Because people in heaven are aware of things they do while they're down here. They're aware of it. They're, they're aware of their families. They're aware of what they have done while they were here as well. And I'm sure they talk about it. And I hope when we leave this earth, either by natural death or by the coming of the Lord, that when we get to heaven, we'll have something to say besides, well, I survived. I don't want to give a report to Jesus. Well, I'm glad I made it. I had to hold on. It was getting tough down there. I want to live with boldness. I want to live with faith. I want to live with power within me that comes from heaven. I don't want to be intimidated and fear, man. I don't want to tiptoe through the earth. I want to stomp through the earth. I want to walk through it strongly and let them know I'm here. I'm here to do something for you. I'm not afraid of a devil. I'm not afraid of your enemies. And I'm not afraid of you. I've come to bless you. I've come to lift you up. I've come to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ. So many people, they're nervous about being bold in God. How do you get boldness? You ask God for it. Dr. Lake, I'm sure, was bold many times. He didn't start out with that boldness. He started out with relatives that were in dying, that were sick, that were crippled, that had cancers. He started out being under the weight of sickness. And one day he stood up. He made the great comment, you know, that sickness is a dose of death. And he says, I got Jesus in me. He only gives me life. And I'm not committing sins that cause the wages of sin that cause death. He said, I don't want it. And I tell you, one day, he got totally free himself. And you and I, we are going to live whole, and we're going to live healthy. And if you're sick today, God can heal you. God can make you strong. If you reach out to him, just the size of a mustard seed seed is what's going to actually cause your faith to go to God, and God will touch you and make you whole. One touch of his gentle power will cure you from all of the major illnesses and troubles within your body. God's not against you, and God didn't give it to you. God is on the good side, doing good things to you and I. I hope that as we've discussed Dr. Lake's ministry, there's so much more we could say. We just gave you a little bit of the highlights, some of the great testimonies. I hope you'll get his books and read his sermons and get his life story books that are out. And if we can help you with those things, you can write our ministry and call us and we'll tell you how to get them or we may have them in ourselves in our own bookstore. And so we want more of Dr. Lake's books. All of his sermons are available in the teachings and his life stories that'll inspire your faith. And we just pray that many of you watching will grow up and have a great healing ministry. Just learn from the good things he did. Learn from some of the challenging things he missed it. Don't make the same mistakes. Value your family. Live strong for God. Have boldness. Don't ever be ashamed to speak out strong. Don't be ashamed to lift up your hand and to heal the sick, to cast out the devils, and to stand there and say, God still heals today. He's not dead. He is alive. You know, when I read those books many years ago, they wanted me to get up and start praying with the sick. And still today, I'll go back and read certain of his books today that inspire my faith, help my mind stay renewed. And so many times these great words and these great things that these great men have said are still living words. If you'll get them inside your spirit, you'll come alive. May God richly bless you, and we'll see you again. We want you every week to come back and be with us. We want you to know that we're here to bless you. We're here to help change you. We're here to help you make you an end time warrior that's not afraid of anything, that's ready to invade everything and do what God's called us to do in these last days. Please, when you write, send your prayer request in. Also, you may want to know more information about the Bible School that we have in Southern California. So make sure you say, send me the Bible School information or look it up on the website and have all the information about it. Or if you're in Southern California, you're flying through Los Angeles, we're about an hour south of Los Angeles 
Angeles Airport in the city called Irvine. We'd love to have you on a Sunday morning or a Tuesday night, or you can just come any time of the week and come in and visit the Bible school and sit in some of the classes. Also, if you want more information about where I may be speaking, I may be in your area and you may not know it, so make sure that you look it up on the website or when you're requesting the tape series here and the special offer with the book. Make sure you say, send me Robert's itinerary, or just call and we'll tell you where I'll be, and we'll hope to see you there. We hope to see you next week as well, too. Have a wonderful day.